All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to Confessions of Reformer. I'm your host, Mike Mayashiro. Got a special guest today. Very excited about this conversation. Obviously, I came out as a gay man and I've done a lot of LGBTQ plus advocacy work, especially on social media. When I was initially coming out, one of the parts of this journey that I felt very curious and desirous to learn more about was the trans experience. I didn't have any experience personally to bring to the table on that, but then just also didn't know very many trans people. Thankfully, now I know a few trans people. I'm really thankful for the proximity and exposure and all that I've gotten to experience. I don't know, there's something about when I talk to trans people in particular or non-binary people about that experience and what they have ex like witnessed about God and there's this like expansion and hope that pops in my soul that I don't even realize was missing and it like it happens and I love it and I'm like so intrigued and like grateful for what comes out of that space. So anyway, all that to say, I'm very excited to host my first ever trans person. So I want to introduce you guys to my friend, Ashton Colby. I'll share how we met, but Ashton, why don't you introduce yourself first? Can you tell them who are you? What do you do? So I'm a transgender advocate and I advocate at the state and federal level for LGBTQ public policy and basic human rights for trans people and gay people and all of the above. And a lot of the anti-LGBTQ policy we're seeing right now is influenced by the conservative side and, and use Christianity to really alienate a lot of people from their basic human rights. And so I talk about my experience as a transgender man and being raised as a Christian and still having a sense of faith and spirituality throughout this whole process. And I'm a social entrepreneur and content creator and new do all the things and I'm alongside Mike and doing a lot of stuff and speaking and yeah I'm excited to talk about all all the things related to being trans today we're gonna talk about all the things so cool so Ashton thanks for being here I met Ashton because of a couple of people in the rainbow room so that's the the mentorship group that I run every week for queer Christians uh, we were talking about having trans people come into the conversation and a few of them referred Ashton to me so they sent me his Instagram account and I was like who is this person so then I messaged Ashton I was like hey you're being referred to me by a few people would love to chat so we got on a zoom call and we talked for a way longer than either one of us expected i think oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> yeah it was a few hours and it was like a really cool conversation and just we had, i think we had a lot more in common than either of us realized initially and there was such depth and but it was awesome so i anyway it was not hard for me to be like dude can you jump on my podcast with me i want people to get the, you know so we're here so i'm very excited for you guys to get to hear from ashton um, from his perspective his experience his journey the things he's aware of the things he's touched there's such depth here that i am so excited to get to introduce you to. Ashton, I want to, we've got some questions. I want to hit you with some questions about the trans experience, but before we do any of that kind of stuff, I would love to kind of just hear your story. Like, sure. can you share with us the journey of being a trans person and what that was like and any and all the details you want to share? And before <laughs> he gets into any of this, I just want to remind everyone, I told Ashton before we started recording, you have permission to say whatever you want to say, however you want to say it. We all just get to work out what we're going to do with what you say, but I don't want Ashton to have to think about how he's going to cater to other people's offense or, you know, lack of education or any of that stuff. I want Ashton to just say what he wants to say, however he wants to, and then we all get to do the work of figuring out what we're going to do with that. All right. Yeah. All right. Ashton, it's yours. Take us away. Tell hey, us your story. I appreciate that because yeah. I think we just got to be real. And so, yeah, I came out as a transgender guy over 10 years ago. And so it was a lot different coming out in 2012, 2011 than it was now. And so I lived through the not really having anyone else be transgender around me and then starting to see like 2014, 2015, just a few like mainstream TV shows to start talking about this more and more. And then we get 2016, a lot of anti-trans bathroom bills and like positive representation. And then there was the backlash, negative, like anti stuff. And so I've lived through that interesting, like 180 in my trans experience where nobody knew about what it was to be trans. Then within three to five years, while I'm transitioning alongside of this, there's this explosion of trans things in the media. So things have gotten better and then they've equally gotten worse. So it's just been very bizarre to be a trans person over the last decade. And I'm 30. And so I came out when I was around like 19, 20 years old. And I first knew myself to be a lesbian. And that was when I was around high school, but I still tried to date boys and still tried to be 
like really girly to try to push down any sense of masculinity that I had within my heart. And I did a lot of praying, Hey God, don't like, can I not be gay? Can I not be trans? Can I not feel this way inside of me? And, you know, as much as I prayed, those feelings didn't go away. And so I wanted to live the life that I felt like was most aligned with my heart and my spirit and my body. And it wasn't a hundred percent true for me to come out as gay. And so when I went off to college, my freshman year, I was surrounded by girls on an all girls dorm floor at a Catholic university. And I realized, okay, I am not like everyone else here. I feel so out of place. I feel very isolated. And it wasn't just the normal, like freshman blues of being away from home at college. It was, okay, I am a boy. No one else sees me like that. And now I have to explore that. But it was like, okay, dark night of the soul. I believe in God. Is this going to be a sin if I come out as transgender even more than being gay? Is it worth me even living? And so I really questioned that. And luckily I had the support of my dad and my very Catholic grandmother who (laughs) was kind enough to be like, you know what, ultimately God only cares about you be a good person. And so that was simple enough for me to realize like, okay, I can come out and I can transition and what matters most is how I treat other people and how I treat myself and identity aside or anything else that I have to do to live aside. If I can still hear God, then I'm doing the right thing. And ultimately I just had to move forward. So I started taking testosterone in 2012 and go ahead. Yeah, I want to, I want to ask a question before we move on too far in the yeah. story real quick. I just want to point out. I want to acknowledge the people who are listening who maybe are still part of the traditional, maybe evangelical or whatever, like worldview theology, where when you when you hear Ashton say, um, like his grandmother was like, well, I think God mo- mostly only cares about you being a good person or right. like how you treat other people. When Before I deconstructed, I was trained to hear that kind of rhetoric as anti-Christian, as unbiblical, as heretical, right? Because um, in our theology back then when I was part of that whole camp, it wasn't about how you lived. It wasn't about the decisions you made or the works you did, right? Or how you treated people. That was all secondary. That was peripheral. The central thing God cared about was, did you believe the right things, And maybe more specifically, did you believe the right thing, aka did you believe the right things about Jesus? Did you believe the right things about his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection? Did you believe the right things about him? And then are you rightly believing who he is to you? Is Jesus Lord and Savior, God of your life? God cares more about that. Who cares how you live or how you treat people? That matters somewhere, but we care way more about are you believing and saying and claiming the right stuff about Jesus? If you do, great. Then the stuff you do, we can celebrate. If you don't claim that, then nothing you do matters. It's all filthy rags in the eyes of God, right? Like you're not in. It was, it was that attitude. Do you want to respond to that rhetoric before? Yeah. I mean, I love that because. Wait, you love what? I love that question. I love (laughs) that insight. I love that perspective of like, people still try now to convert me to love God more, to believe more deeply in their understanding of Jesus. They, they actively try to, when I was 12 and 15 at Bible, uh, call, uh, Bible camp, and I was already saying, yeah, I, I gave my life to God. And I was already claiming that in my heart. And yet that still wasn't enough. They say that but then they'll still assume because you're transgender, you can't know God at all. It literally got me to the point where I was staring up at the ceiling in my college dorm room and I'm either going to have to end my life or I'm going to have to transition. And it's not that I ever didn't believe that or believe all these things that people try to convert me into trying to believe to somehow save me. It's that I already had that foundation. And on top of that, I was trans and I just had to live this way. And so it's like, either way, if I'm trans in any capacity, they don't care if I believe in Jesus or not. Like that's, that's irrelevant to them. That's how I feel. And that's my experience over and over again. You are trans and then you don't know Jesus. And like it's so, mutually exclusive. You couldn't possibly know Jesus, believe yeah, in Jesus, yeah. have a relationship with Jesus like I do 
if you right. consider yourself or identify as a trans person. Those you just can't. Yeah. yeah, they just assume Which not possible. You, you and I both were out here doing the damn thing. Yeah. Totally disagree. That's not true, really? right? Yeah. yeah, love it. Okay, so when you were at the Catholic University, yeah, you were you at that point before that experience basically just identified as a lesbian. You were attracted to yeah. women. You were a woman in a woman's body. So sure. you were a lesbian, and then being in the in that dorm situation you're like oh it's not just yeah. that i'm a lesbian it's like i'm a guy right. i want to yeah. know if you're up for sharing totally what were the actual experiences that that lent toward yeah. that thought process what happened i have memories of me like walking across the green in the campus to and from class remembering how i saw myself having just moments of like how everyone else sees me is not how I see myself. And it's not even close. It's completely like a 180 from what I actually feel. It got to the point where I was getting done with class on Friday, stockpiling on snacks and stuff, and then going into my dorm room and not leaving my dorm room other than to go to the cafeteria, go to the bathroom and shower. And then I would go right back to my dorm room not talk to anybody completely isolated because I felt like the the guys that I wanted to be friends with saw me as a cute girl and the girls around me wanted me to you know I don't know paint nails with them and stuff in the dorms like all the other and I didn't want to do either of those things I didn't want the guys to be my boyfriend and I didn't want to paint my nails with the girls. And so I found like maybe a few friends that were also like LGBT that I could hang out with. But other than that, I was like really, really super isolated. And I just wanted people to see me in an authentic way. And it went way more than just, okay, I need people to see me as like a lesbian. It just wasn't true. I can see how that'd be so isolating and make you feel so misunderstood and alone. And I think straight people, broad stroke, generalizing here, a lot of straight privilege blinds people from recognizing how maybe dehumanizing or disembodying the yeah. experience can be of everyone treating you contrary to what you experience. So obviously I'm not trans, but even yeah. just as a gay man, like there, some of what you're saying rang true in my experience. Totally. All the girls, I wanted to be friends with them, but they always end up, ended up like wanting more. Oh, this always yeah. meant like deeper connection. Let's, let's turn this into something that I didn't want. Totally. And then guys, they wanted to just like rough house and be buds and whatever. And I like always wanted something more. I'm like, oh God. And I just, yeah. none of it, never yeah. in either side of the tracks, like went in a way that made sense for me. And yeah, it was just so like isolating. And when you were in college, you were already out as a lesbian. I tried, to, like my closest friends knew, some people on campus knew, but I tried to keep it pretty quiet just because I was living with mostly girls and I just <laughs> I knew that would be awkward anyway just out of I didn't want them to think I was we all, all had to share the same communal bathroom and stuff I wanted people to just realize I'm not I'm not there for any other reason than just to try to go to class like everybody else yeah so I had to hide even when I thought the closest thing was for me to be a lesbian I still didn't feel like I could even share that in college okay so you were still basically in the closet at large yeah as a lesbian, but you were also like thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not just a lesbian. Was there a moment where you're like, oh crap, I'm, I'm not just a lesbian. I'm a guy. Was there a definitive moment or was it just, was it like a progressive, mm. you know, many, I don't know. Like, yeah, to me, it feels like, yeah. it feels like maybe it's oversimplifying, but yeah. like there was a line in your yeah. own process of recognizing, oh, cause I remember the day I realized yeah. I was gay, I was 10 and it was like this, like, that's not true for everyone, but for me, it was like, oh, I'm yay that's yeah. what's wrong with me right was like the so i'm like man to go from i'm a lesbian to oh whoa 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 i am presenting the incorrect gender to the sure. world and was there a moment or what yeah i'd want to hear if yeah so as like a little kid people always want to know like did you know since you were a kid and in many ways if no one had ever got to the point where maybe like i was 9, 10, 11, 12, where you start to get made fun of for being a tomboy. If no one started to make fun of me for wanting to wear 
cargo shorts and wear camo and dress like Hercules as a, like, luckily my parents were relatively like, whatever, we don't really care what you want to wear for Halloween. And I got to have a little boy's childhood up until the point where other kids on the playground started to make fun of me. But like, I was Hercules for Halloween when I was five. I, I was, you know, Batman and stuff. Like I chose all those costumes and my parents luckily didn't care but I had distinct moments where it was like okay you need to start wearing pink that was the line I heard from other people's parents other my best friends parents that were girls and then when I wore pink it was oh you look so beautiful you look so cute you, you should dress like that all the time and so I started to internalize like okay how I want to dress gets me made fun of how I get treated when I dress like a girl wear little pink hearts on my t-shirt I get affirmation externally so I'm gonna go with what feels like the path of least resistance so as I was in fourth grade fifth grade middle school especially you get way made fun of <laughs> if you do any deviation of what you're expected to. And I started to really learn, I would say around nine, you're not a boy. This is not, you can't dress like this. You have to dress like a girl. And so, especially in high school, it just magnified. It was like, okay, now it's prom, it's homecoming, it's boyfriends asking you to dances. It's you start wearing makeup to school, you learn of what hair extensions are, you wear, you know, all those like even more bifurcation of like boys do this and girls do this because you're going to leave high school and you're going to go out and you're going to be a woman and a man. And you, you're supposed to be priming yourself for eventually getting married and living with kids and all that. And even though I knew who I was, I did not have the space to own that truth. And so it did look like a ton of denial. I competed in beauty pageants. I was 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, competing like at a high level all the way to like top 30 in Miss Ohio, USA, doing all that. And so you talk about light bulb moments. It was, I'm on the stage in hair extensions full makeup, evening gown. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Why am I perform literally putting on a performance? And so I remember like crying to my dad after I didn't win Miss Ohio, but it was more tears of relief that I didn't ever have to do that again if I didn't want to. And not because I lost. And I think people were crying because I, they thought I was crying because I lost, but it was really like, that was a light bulb moment for me of like, all right, I gave it the best run that I could to try to be a woman. This ain't it. And that was when I was a freshman in college competing at that level. And so it was all these things within a period of six months that just in the fall of my freshman year of college was a bunch of light bulb moments back to back. And then I came out like within a few months after that, I, I just totally went for it, told my family and started making changes physically I know it's so funny now like to be like oh I did beauty pageants but it's, it's such an icebreaker though because yeah. people are like what the hell are you talking about <laughs> and I used to be ashamed of looking at the pictures of it and now I'm like you know what that is a part of who I am that's a part of who I was it's not something that I have to be ashamed of it's actually like I find humor in it but also like I have reverence for that part of who I am am and was and I try not to see myself as like two people like before I transitioned and after I try the best that I can to live as one whole integrated person like I don't say my dead name I don't feel like I died I don't feel like that was a whole other person and I went through trying to shut that part of my life totally off and not sharing anything like that but I found so much meaning in like being open and being an advocate and sharing it and showing people what's possible. So I don't, I don't care if people know what I look like before. And it's just because I want trans people to know that like you can really transition no matter, no matter who you were before, or who you tried to be, how you feel is still valid. Oftentimes trans people <laughs> will consider the way they presented before their transition as like, a dead person like that person is gone yeah. they don't want to reference that person anymore they don't want to talk about that person they don't want that person you know acknowledged their yeah. dead name right that the name that they used to have when they 
you know, we're presenting as the wrong gender or the dead, gone, past, yeah. offensive almost, right? Like, don't bring it up. Like, we can now start talking about, like, the physical changes and stuff, but that's usually different. A lot of trans people don't even want to talk about that. And so if I, I'm being right now in this space, like, super open and super vulnerable and, like, sharing because I care and I, because I get filled up by advocating in this way, but like every trans person is different. And so I try to have respect for people who really do see it as like, they were a totally different person and, and they don't want to talk about their physical changes and they don't want to be open and advocate about it. That's totally fine. It takes a lot of energy to do this and share to this level, yeah. but I also like know that people are still trying to learn. And so I 100% have to share. And I have learned that like, I'm choosing to not have shame about who I used to be because it's just too much work to try to shut the door on that and pretend like I never was something, you know, it's just, this is just who I am, all of it. How would you different differentiate being a trans guy from yeah. someone who would present as like being non-binary. Yeah, I think that there can even be overlap. Like I feel like in a lot of ways, the easiest thing for me to identify as or like say to people is, okay, I transitioned from female to male. If you've never heard about anything trans, you would probably understand generally what that meant. Like I try to use the most rudimentary language in case people don't know basically i transitioned from female to male so i'm a man that happens to be transgender so i'm a transgender man if i had transitioned from male to female then i would be a woman that happened to be trans so i would be a trans woman as far as non-binary people go there is a lot more depth to gender than just like man and woman, male and female. Even when I first came out as a transgender man, I was like, non-binary people are not real. That doesn't exist. Like that's, yeah, I had a ton of judgment. I had a lot of like, you know, the only thing that is valid is if you're a trans woman or a trans man. And so as I've personally, I mean, and this again was over a decade ago. Right. So I have started to understand that there are a lot of people now that are starting to identify outside of those rigid expectations of what it means to be a man, male, or a woman, female. And there are people who are even born biologically, their sex is beyond what people want to box in as male and female. And those people are intersex. And that doesn't fit in the binary that we know as, as sex, one or the other check a box here or check a box here, no other options. For me, like in so many ways, like being transgender, I feel like I'm outside the binary. Like I feel like I'm non-binary just by default of like being trans, but not all trans people feel that way. And it's like, we're so individual. And I think on a spiritual level, like what I know to be God is way bigger than an old man in the sky, like judging everybody with a beard, like the he aspects of God, like when you just limit God to this man and you don't, and that's all you see God to be, you're totally discrediting like the divine femininity that is inherent and just as valuable. And so I feel like I embody way more beyond like the binary, just just on a spiritual level, like non-binary people like reflect that God is be non-binary in, in many ways. Like God's not an old dude. Like, I mean, you could see God like that, but, but you also got to know it's like way more than that. When it comes to trans people and the surgery that they've undergone or, you know, whatever kind of physical like alterations they've made to themselves for the record. And I think it took me a minute to understand and emotionally accept this boundary not because I didn't like it. I just didn't, I was like, okay, well, where does that come from? No trans person owes anyone an explanation about their past, about what alterations their body has undergone. Like that's nobody's business. That's not, we're not entitled to that information, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think initially I was like, wait, what do you mean? Like, because it feels like for a trans person to go through all this process and journey, I feel like there was a bit of a, almost a demand or like an entitlement, like you owe that explanation to me. Cause, but that was, I think I, as I kept learning and like per, paying attention to the conversation, it felt like that entitlement was there because there was this predicated 
assumption or judgment that as a trans person, you betrayed me. Uh-huh. I never would have said that. Yeah. I didn't ever like perceive it that way. But as I, my mind continued to change and I just kept learning and growing in understanding all this, I think I look back on that attitude now, that just visceral emotional pushback. I'm like, why wouldn't, why would, why are you advocating for like getting to hide this from me? I think I deserve to know. I'm looking right. back at that attitude and I'm like, ew, I'm embarrassed that that attitude was there. But I think it was there because I was viewing a trans person going on this journey as betraying whatever yeah. appropriate fundamental baseline that I didn't yeah. even, it was an implicit bias. I didn't even know that I had that expectation or, you know, and so I just want to throw out for those, because I'm assuming a lot of you listening right now, maybe you're probably coming from the same place because I wasn't a transphobe. I just didn't understand. I was just so yeah. removed from the conversation that I didn't even recognize the bias and the prejudice and the judgment that I brought to the, the conversation. So for the record, no trans person owes anyone an explanation over their history, over what's going on under their clothes. Like, that's yeah. so dehumanizing to demand that from anyone for to even ask them is like borderline inappropriate, you know? So I just want to throw that out as like a base level of respect and understanding for the humanization, the, like the humanizing yeah. of trans people in their journey is like, you don't, aren't, you aren't owed that information. Yeah. You're not owed that it from their life. You're not privy to that. You know, if they choose to share, that's their choice and you're privileged to get to know that. And that's true for us, like outside of the gender conversation, there's so many things about just in the straight binary world that we're all like trying to recover from there are also degrees of boundaries and respect that we recognize easily there if someone has a surgery you don't just go in and ask all these invasive questions about what all that entailed and what happened like we respect the boundaries there right and so this is even more so delicate sensitive personal intimate right and so like it shouldn't be hard for us to translate the boundaries that we already have existing within the world we're familiar with and continuing to hold that same level of respect for the human in front of us. I just wanted to say that out loud. Because yeah. It took me a minute to figure that out and like recognize and get it right. But now yeah. I'm kind of embarrassed by, you know, what I didn't get. And I was just ignorance. You know, I just didn't know. It took work to like get to undo and like bring real authentic respect and regard to all the things and not just let my curiosity totally Totally. side make peripheral someone's dignity you know like (laughs) anyway so yeah that's the reason why people joke oh like i i got caught with my pants down i have my my dignity you know it's like it's it's we don't there's i joke always like we don't shake hands with what's between our legs like for a reason because it's not you know we get to choose how we share our bodies and and our bodies are sacred like I think that my body is so sacred and a lot of people want to say like oh you're going against what you were designed to be you're changing the body that you were born into like there's clearly you you are defaming your body but I have so much respect for being born in a quote-unquote female body like when I first started learning about trans people, I was so fascinated by the surgeries, by the hormone therapy. Like I wanted to know about what are the physical changes? What do you mean? Like, how does somebody get a surgery to change their gender? What does that look like? It is fascinating. I just want to acknowledge, like, this is such a new thing and people like, it's not new. It's, it's not, but it's becoming so talked about in our culture, especially in Western culture that like, it's affecting like public policy to the point, like, you know, there are people like myself who are trans that I just have to share. I just, I am going to talk about surgery. I am going to talk about that because trans people want to know what do I need to do if I need to transition? And if trans people aren't sharing it, where are they going to learn this? And I know how how helpful it was for me to learn about it. We can vibe and talk about that now. And with the understanding that what makes me trans is way more than just, I'm a person that got some surgery or I'm this collection of body parts Mm. or I'm this identity, like totally alienated from my body. Like I am fully embodied. I am fully conscious and coherent of like how my identity and my body and my spirit and my thoughts and beliefs like all come together to make me as one whole person that just happens to be transgender, that just happens to have had to get some surgery and hormones to live a better quality of life. The part of the building bridges is like, let's let's get a baseline. Like surgery is really interesting. (laughs) So let's talk about it. We're going to pause there. 
That concludes part one of my interview with Ashton. Be sure to check out part two. Ashton's going to share what logistically it was like to go from female to male, that transition, and even emotionally. I'm really thankful for him taking the time and the vulnerability to share that process with me. I'm excited for you to get to hear that as well. If you're a queer person and you're looking for a space to belong, to be around other people who are like you, maybe you're trying to reconcile your faith with your sexuality, you should check out the Rainbow Room. It's a group that I lead personally every week. Uh, we have space for you to join us if that's something that would be beneficial for you. You can check out more information about that with the link below. If you're an ally, if you're in a space where you're trying to figure out how to better show up for the queer people in the world and you need a space to be able to process stuff like that with other allies, we have a group specifically designed for people just like you. So you can check that out with the group below. It's called Allies. And then lastly, this is something new for me, but um, I've stepped back into the life coaching game. I used to do it a lot. I love it. I'm actually really good at it. I took some time away to work on some other things, but I'm back in the game. I only have a limited availability, but if you're interested in working with me, I provided a link below for you to check that out as well. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out part two.